Karim is a storyteller, sorry, a storyteller, a teacher and campaigner for social and environmental justice. Uh, she currently works for the London Mining Network, a charity that works in solidarity with communities around the world who are threatened by mining. She also has many years experience of working with schools to create materials to raise awareness and stimulate discussion about colonialism, the environment, racism and women's rights. And Karima said it might be a bit, um, some of the subject uh, might be quite uh, controversial, so that, that sounds really good to me. So uh, w when you're ready, Karima. Okay, thank you. Um, well, what I'd like to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen straight away um, and, uh, and then I'll get started. Um, I think I probably should have put that on to, um, sorry, let me go back. Should I have made that a, actually uh, as a slideshow before I share it? I, I wouldn't worry, Karima. I would just okay. like that. Right. That works great. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, except that, that, okay, never mind. Um, okay, so, well, thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me to speak. And um, uh, the provo provocation today is what about a world without mining? Um, so I, as uh, Harry mentioned, I work as the education coordinator for London Mining Network. So we hold London-based mining companies to account by working in solidarity with mining affected communities. Uh, we work with communities all over the world. Um, we're a very small organization. Um, most of us work only part-time. We have a small budget um, and uh, yeah, one of the main things we do is uh, we uh, um, go to company AGMs as dissident shareholders, bringing community representatives over and organizing events outside, uh, like um, protests and public meetings. And then we also support with advocacy, research, and so on um, uh, for, you know, based on communities. Our work is very much led by people, by the people who are actually on the front lines of that mining and um, you know, what it is, whatever it is they would like us to support them with, that is how we work. So let's get started. Uh, mining companies um, are, as you can see, they present themselves as highly professional, benign scientific and commercial institutions. They have very slick marketing. They say all the right things. You know, they uh, have careers that they want hope will appeal to women or to um, people of color, nationals of developing countries and so on, um, as you can see from some of this here. Karina, but, sorry, I think it's not sharing for me, sorry. Uh, oh, it, sorry. It might the next slide, is this sharing now? The new it slide? Is, yeah. 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 Okay, so this is the, the slick marketing um, that they do to appeal to people. Now, I understand that in schools, um, people think about what, when they're talking about careers, especially if you're a scientist or a geographer, there's the possibility of working for a mining company, which or doing apprenticeships with them or training with them in some way, or actually pursuing a career in the mining industry. And this looks very appealing. But I would like to tell you a different story. Um, and the story links to a current event that we are Holding. So in three days time, we will be um, at the BHP AGM. BHP is one of the biggest mining companies in the world. And um, uh, that we have worked with communities who are um, resisting the actions of BHP in several countries, particularly in Latin America. And this particular story that I'm going to share with you is set in Colombia in a region called La Guajira uh, now. Because I'm not able to um, do the slideshow, I can't do the clever activity that I planned. But can you see the screen? Is that okay? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, let me just see if I can make this into a slideshow. No. no, sadly, it's not. It's refusing to. Okay, so. Um, underneath this picture here, which I'm going to move for a second, is, is a, um, sorry, as you can see, 
one of those diagrams that shows, this is a very idealized version, but one of those diagrams that shows the layers of rock with a seam of coal. And then under some of the pictures, which I'll move out of the way, there is a river, there is the water table, um, and then there's the surface of the land. So um, this is an interactive activity that I normally do in person in schools with people um, where the young people are involved in creating a picture. But I would we, I asked them, what is missing from this diagram? And of course, um, first of all, we need to talk about what's there, but then um, so the, the river and the water table um, and the layers of rock and the coal seam, but then what is above that? So the trees, for example, these are varieties of trees that are found in this region of Colombia, um, this forest. Um, it's a kind of a dry tropical biome and any rainfall failure or too much abstraction of water can turn this very fragile land to desert. Uh, then there are the animals that live there, the, um, the military macaw, for example. Then on this, uh, there's the um, a special bat that uh, feeds off the cactus flowers on um, that, that grow. This is the uh, dagger cactus, which the local people use for fencing, they grow it. And I just think, how cool is that? You have a bat that comes and feeds on the nectar of the flowers that grow in this cactus around your home. Um, there's the Rancheria River, and this river with its water table provides drinking water for over 50,000 people in the region and conserving water and using it widely is very important to the way of life of people there, the Waiyu people. Um, strongly associated with the river, let's see if I can find the picture, if I move it out of the way. No, it's not there. Okay, this is uh, the jaguar, a very iconic animal. Um, and um, also, yeah, that, okay. Sorry, uh, and a jaguar is also associated with the river. So the Waiyu people have lived here for hundreds of years. In the 18th century, they successfully fought off the Spanish. However, um, when African slaves were escaping uh, captivity, they were made welcome. And so a mix, they've lived side by side for a couple of hundred years and sometimes have mixed. So we have these two communities here. Um, the Waiyu in particular are noted for weaving hammocks and they have a very rich culture um, sort of an interpretation of dreams and stories. Gabriel Gatia Marquez, who's the author of The Hundred Years of Solitude, drew on their stories and spiritual beliefs. They are, along with the Afro-Colombians that live side by side with them, largely self-sufficient. They grow food, tend goats, chickens, pigs, they do fishing. There's minimal harm caused to the land and they are able to grow its sufficient um, food to sell. And uh, one of the um, activists from this area who uh, spoke to us a couple of years ago described this life as buen vivir or the good life, which is a, a kind of, a, which is also a, a, a theory that, an, um, a theoretical alternative to our industrial life because um, there's a Latin American thinker called uh, Goodenough who's written about this buen vivir. And this person from this community, one of the Afro-Colombians described it as being able to look out of your window, see this beautiful land, the river provided the water, the, what you needed was in the forest or it grew, you planted it, and this was the good life. So what happened? Well, in 1984, the UK closures, closures of coal mines began. And in exactly the same year, the Serajon mine opened on, in La Guajira on Wayu land. Um, it was in the early days, it was owned, it was, uh, owned by Exxon, who um, made money as being, from being part of OPEC. Uh, out of oil and then they used that to buy this coal mine, but then it was sold, it was sold several times and eventually bought by a consortium of Glencore, BHP and Anglo-American. Uh, Glencore Swiss company with a London connection, BHP and Anglo-American listed on the London Stock Exchange. At least 17 YU um, communities were violently displaced 
including the small town of Tabaco with 700 residents. And this was where the community's local post office, school and health center were all gone. So those who weren't actually violently driven out and the mining brought militarization to the area um, and persecution of opposition, people resisting it and so on. Um, those others were driven away when their land and water became either too depleted or too contaminated for them to survive. This mine is 30 miles long and five miles wide. And um, for over 30 years, the UK has imported coal from this mine. So our lights went on because of this mine. The local communities have resisted the mine from the beginning. There is um, a solidarity and communication between them and the workers at the mine, which is another site of conflict, um, which the workers' struggles there, which I won't go into just at this point, but we may want to come back to that discussion as well later. And in 2007, um, which was a bit late for the YU community here, but the idea of FPIC, free, prior and informed consent, gave indigenous people, indigenous communities, the right to say no to mining on their land. Um, and uh, it is not legally backed up, but it's nevertheless, it is in principle, a thing that they can assert. And a similar, a similar set of rules also exists for non-indigenous people, but you know, say peasants and other groups that are reliant on land um, as well to object to mining a bit like I suppose, our planning permission here. Um, anyway, the, to cut a long story short, the Serahon mine, both the land rights issues and the labor issues is absolutely mired in controversy, conflict and human rights violations. And in June, 2020, lawyers for the YU community lodged a request to the UN Rapporteur for Human Rights and Environment for work to be stopped there. Um, and in September 2020, a further seven UN, uh, six UN rapporteurs called for the same on human rights, rights to food, rights to health because of the air pollution there and the pollution of the water, water and sanitation, the rapporteur on those, the rapporteur on extreme poverty that has been caused by the mine, the rapporteur on hazardous sub substances and waste, and the UN rapporteur on indigenous people. So it is not, the story that mining companies would like to present about themselves. Um, and there is, weren't, aren't these happy people who have wearing helmets and have glamorous jobs in the mining industry that you see in their photographs. Um, I just want to add though, that this is not a single story. I could tell you the same story for large areas of India where indigenous people who have lived self, pretty much self-sufficiently um, and peasants and other groups of people um, on, in the forests and off the land um, have been displaced in large numbers by mining companies um, and mining coal. But it's not just coal as well. Coal in this current climate, or this current climate emergency, if you like, would seem like an easy target. But it's not just coal. This is what mining is for almost every mineral. So just to say that mining companies are positioning themselves as the saviors of the planet. And this is BHP's homepage. They are pulling out of coal. Uh, in fact, they have sold, they're, they're selling the Serahan mine. Glencore has bought it um, and bought them out. And they are actually leaving the London Stock Exchange. This is their final year here. Um, so uh, because they are going to be, of course, helping us make the green, the bright, shiny, green new world. Um, however, as an LMN War on Want report um, makes very clear, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute, so, um, we cannot mine our way out of the climate crisis. Numerous conflicts, destruction, pollution, etc., already relate to green transition minerals. This is only set to increase if we continue on the current path. And this list of the problems associated with all of these minerals which are mined um, uh, is a, comes from the report, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. 
So, um, so this, um, I will put the link to this, well, this the, the link to this um, will go in the chat later. Um, but this, I really strongly recommend that if um, you want to know more about this stuff, which um, just before we started, I was having a chat with Harry and he said he'd like to know more. This report is a, um, a very up-to-date report that actually discusses the problem of the mining, the, you know, that the, the people and the environments that will be sacrificed to mining while mining companies continue to profit from this unjust and arbitrary and volatile transition. Um, so uh, a material transition, and we can, you can find it on our website. We have a section called reports and you can also find it on the War and Want website. So what are the answers? This is the more difficult question. It's easy enough to see what's wrong. Um, because the picture is actually extremely bleak. How do we engage with young people um, around these questions? What kind of world do we want them to create for the future? See, um, I think perhaps one of the starting points, which the speaker last time mentioned as well, compassion and empathy would be a good place to start. So, Let's talk about phones briefly. Um, there are more than maybe over 250,000 young people, but the people mining cobalt in the DRC, a vital component in, in uh, mobile phones, for example. 35,000 of whom roughly are children, some as young as six, under, as you can see from this picture, appalling conditions. I think what we perhaps tried, need to try and inculcate is the things that we hold in our hands, the gadgets, what price have other people paid for that? And we need to think about that and think about how we can act more in line with you know, how we feel about that. So feelings, I think, are a really important part of this. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we should really be asking ourselves, do we really want these things when they are based on so much pain for others? Or should, and should we also be setting up debates around um, false oppositions in classrooms? When I um, uh, take the phone cycle game that some of you might have seen in the website um, in schools, um, you do get the question that's raised, you know, well, what mining brings jobs and so on. And we have to be careful of these what I think are possibly false binaries, such as, you know, jobs versus land rights, or no progress without some pain and suffering, as often when people teach about the Industrial Revolution, they say, well, you know, the West went through this pain, and now other countries maybe should, or, uh, or will, or, you know, do we really want to teach our children to live in a world of hard choices in which some must suffer, but of course, never ourselves, so that others might live well? I think that's a really important question to ask. And uh, even though it sounds rather moralistic, and we, but, and then we should ask, or are there other ways forward? Are there other solutions? So, but, um, so at LMN, we've also got another report that would be of interest to you. Um, I couldn't resist sharing this, that Robert McFarlane tweeted that this was one of the best things that he had read. And this is about a just transition. So should we be teaching that there are other ways out of the system that we have got where we can take into account all these apparently opposing problems like workers who might lose their jobs if we go to a greener future, people who might have to lose their land in order that we can have progress, so-called, um, or are there other ways out of this? Should we be teaching more about how to make this just transition? And what kind of just transition should it be? Is the Green New Deal enough, or does it need to be what uh, we, what is called a post-extractive transition. So, um, and um, we sort of, 
I've been thinking about this as have lots of other people because at LMN we are often called to support work that is in solidarity with mine workers as well as communities resisting mining. Sometimes these are the same people. In some areas it is indigenous communities fighting for their land rights, for example in some parts of the Philippines um, in the Cordillera region, but who are also going to work in the mines and belong to the mine workers unions. Um, and it worries me that sometimes I've heard in classrooms there's, that there's some sort of contradiction in this um, uh, and that, you know, it's kind of a, either jobs or land or, and what I think people need to understand is that as well as bringing jobs to a region, mines destroy jobs and or self-sufficiency. So if you, um, that, for example, the Fulbari, there's a full coal mining project, proposed coal mining project called the Fulbari project in Bangladesh. It threatens a rice growing area and it threatens fishing. Those are jobs that are held by thousands of people. And if they are damaged by mining, in fact, there'll be a large loss of jobs. Many jobs were lost, um, you know, the, the land based jobs, maybe not always that brought in income, but did make people able to live in the Serahon mine case as well. So mining destroys existing jobs and it also destroys the potential for alternatives. So for example, if in uh, South Africa, there's um, a campaign, uh, the people are resisting a uh, um, titanium mine um, and um, they have the community there, an indigenous community there, had a proposal for an alternative which was based around ecotourism, which they were, which would have protected their environment, whereas mining destroyed any potential for an alternative like that, um, or would destroy an alternative potential for that. So, um, uh, and the, also the promise of jobs doesn't always deliver. It's not always the local people that get the jobs in the mine. Large open cast mines are not labor intensive and for example at Serahon I understand that initially local people were employed for a short period in the construction of the mine and then there were no more jobs they brought in workers with the skills from elsewhere. Um, so um, the way out of this means we have to think differently about it. Maybe we don't need the mine. Maybe there already are possibilities to build on existing economies. Maybe we need to create other sorts of jobs um, that are less harmful. And maybe we need to actually think quite differently and we should think about how we're encouraging our children in schools to do that as well. So um, let me just relate, re 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 um, return to a material transition. So what does all this mean in practice? How do we discuss with young people the following things? Managing and regulating supply chains to avoid harmful impacts on people and ecosystems. How can we involve them in that? So we're doing a, um, a little bit of research at the moment to link to our phone cycle game to see if it's possible for young people to actually question the procurement and disposal of its tech, um, of the tech equipment in their schools. Um, we should also think about what career choices we're encouraging young people to make. Do we really want them to go and work in mine, the mining industry or in fossil fuel industry? People and planet are at university level um, working on, um, on this in relation to the fossil, um, fossil fuel industries. And um, they are starting to also work with schools and it might be, this might be another connection that could be made. Um, Consumption has to be thought about carefully, not just on an individual basis, but on a social basis. Do we all need to have our own electric car or should we have a better public transport system? Do we want a life where perhaps we walk more um, rather than you know, any transport system at all? Uh, in some areas where people's lives are threatened by mining, they maybe only now and again use a bus if they have to go some distance to, for something. Um, should we also recognize and teach about the work being done by many institutions, the International Resources Panel, UNEP, the International Energy Authority, all sorts of different groups of people who are involved in mapping out how to achieve ecological sustainability. 
and equitable consumption within the planetary boundaries. Has, how do we get all this into our curriculum? How do we encourage young people to know, to know about these things as citizens um, in order to understand the changes that need to be made? And what social, economic and technological changes will we need? What models can we use to discuss these, e.g. circular economies, donut economics, degrowth and so on? Um, so these are just some suggestions that are in this material transition report that I've just um, reinterpreted to perhaps we need to apply these things to the curriculum. There is work being done by people and it needs to filter into schools. So I'm nearly finished because I think my 20 minutes might be well over now. Um, yeah, just, so, just under nine, nine minutes. Right, I've got, how much have I got left? Oh, we just got just under nine minutes to, to the end. Oh, sorry, um, right, okay. So just to finish with a quote, um, this is, uh, I'll, I'll let people read it. Um, so decarbonizing, decolonizing, democracy, and decommodifying our carbon intensive material world is going to require programmatic thinking. It is also going to necessitate the unleashing of enormous amounts of creative labor and inventive praxis to build public institutions of public ecology and a public culture to allow us to survive and flourish on a warming planet. This will require spaces where very different kinds of technical, cultural, political and economic knowledge, labor and practice can meet and develop new modes of collaboration. And finally, if we manage to achieve a just transition, will there still be mining? We hope this will be a post extractivist world in which mining is kept to an absolute minimum based only on need with no other alternative source of material, um, only done with the permission of the people who live on the land or nearby and carried out to the highest environmental and labor standards. Otherwise it should not be happening. And if possible, it should not be happening at all. Thank you. Sorry to go on so long. Uh, superb. Uh, thank you very much, Karima. That was really, uh, really interesting and lots of um, food for thought. Um, I'm definitely going to have a look at the material transition document. I think that looks <laughs> really, really helpful for us teachers. It's funny because you mentioned the DRC. I, I taught a lesson last term on the DRC mm. and you said about empathy and kids, the students are, so, are like really naturally empathetic, mm. aren't they? And they're almost mm. shocked when yep. they see what's happening they have no idea they don't know about yes. cobalt anyway and have no idea where it's come from so i think that's a really good point even just showing them what's in mm. you know just this mystery sort of metal that's in their all, all their devices it's quite quite powerful but um i kind of and i like doing that also it's like what you're talking about really such big systemic changes that are really you know they're so it's hard I find it really challenging to get to get that across to some of the students you know um uh, you know where to start I mean I find it challenging myself you know and I and I I really like what you're saying about the degrowth and, and I read Jason Hickel's book um and I find all that stuff um you know really inspiring but it's it's such a challenging subject to to broach and like you said the economic argument like economics is just has such primacy in our society that 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 it sort of trumps all other arguments doesn't it yeah yeah but as you say people need to know this stuff it, uh, you know it's hidden so much of it is hidden like mining itself is hidden um but and if people knew that would be a start um anyway sorry i'll leave space for other people to talk i'm just going to yeah. put something in the chat some connect some links and things that are useful to people in the chat um, yeah, so okay. can you read, uh, have you read the chat? So Bryce said she'd be interested in using the phone cycle game. Uh, Turkey has just announced its first climate direct directorate in the government, so climate change will finally be taught uh, man or made mandatory in schools there. So uh, mm -hmm. that's good. Hi, Bradley. Yeah. Chatting yes. to myself yes. there, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it has. Um, I'm sorry, I only caught the last like 15 minutes, but everything you have said um just screams project-based learning and getting those kids involved and doing something that they can relate to others and i wish just more teachers would be more radical in terms of their geography 
and actually just get on board with it a bit more instead of you know teaching out of a textbook I suppose or a worksheet <laughs> yes I mean I, I it's hard to say but I think um I think people the teachers need to be braver about saying no this is what we think children need to learn or young people need to learn um it's um I don't know, it's it's very it's it's I think if more teachers were able to challenge the curriculum and challenge the way in which schools are structured and challenge the way in which learning is structured, then there would be less of the opposition and the bullying and the persecution that you get in schools of teachers who want to change things. Um, but, and that's, you know, we obviously all need to support each other with doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I was going to say it feels like there's a big distance between where we need teachers to be and where they are now in the sense of, of, of kind of critically engaging with that idea and concepts of mining. I think very much people think of it as some sort of clean, crisp process which happens removed from humans and to actually kind of humanize that and to bring in the uh, that really empathetic emotional side to it as well of understanding the impact it has on a place because there's this disconnect it's and I was sort of there's parallels with food production as well in that sense of not quite understanding the processes and the mm-hmm. on a place removed from the consumption of that thing mm-hmm. yeah yes yes very much so but with um Clearly food consumption and the extractivist uh, process of food production is damaging, but with mining, the damaging is, is almost final in, in some places and some, some circumstances. Um, you know, it's, and mining companies walk away from situations, if they like on numerous occasions, have walked away from situations where opposition has been so strong, the damage has been so great, they've walked away and they've left the mess. And they've left the mess to, you know, which is so expensive that the poorer countries are not able to pay to clean it up uh, either. So it's, uh, you know, there's, um, that's another, another issue with mining. Um, 